Steve Gilmore on Talk Radio Europe. Now, I don't know what you're doing right now, but uh, whatever it is, I want you to stop. So if you're driving your car, pull in somewhere. If you are the pot around the house, sit yourself down and make yourself comfortable because my next guest I've been looking forward to speaking to for some time and I'm delighted that we've been able to secure, to secure him as a guest on the programme. Now, cast your mind back a few years ago to Iraq when the Saddam Hussein was in charge and his oldest son, Yudi, was... Um, pulling the strings uh, a lot of the times uh, behind the scenes and living the life of an international playboy. What we discovered after the Iraq war, we already knew, but what we discovered was the detail of what went on in that regime and the fact that they had body doubles. My next guest is the author of a book, The Devil's Double. It's now been made into a major motion picture, but he spent a large part of his life as the body double of Uday Hussein. Good morning and welcome to Talk Radio Europe to Latif Yahia. Good morning, Latif. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Latif, um, an unbelievable life you have had. Uh, to say you've been to hell and back would be an understatement. This all started for you at school, didn't it? You went to the same school as Yudi. Yes, I was in the secondary school with Olay Saddam Hussein. And this was in a special school for all the government, rich people. It was a very special school in my area, in Adamiya. And uh, I spent four years with this man in a hell. Now... We, as you touched on, it was a special school, so you had quite a privileged background. You, your parents were quite wealthy. You, you know, it was a, a reasonably nice background that you came from. Um, but the real hell started during the Iran Iraq War when you were an officer on the front line. Uh, but you got a visit one day. Um, do you want to tell us about what happened? Yes, uh, we have a law in Iraq. After you finish university, you go for national service and was Iraq-Iran war. I was an officer in Iraq commandos in Iraq-Iran war. One day my general, he received a letter from the Republic Palace asking him, must look if Yahya come in 72 hours to Republic Palace. And my general, uh, he called me and said, I went to my office immediately. And he said, what did you do? I said, I don't know. He said, look at the letter. And I was shaken because uh, Probably Palace, the logo of the, you know, Iraq. I start thinking, you know, I was 600 kilometers out of Baghdad and Basra. I was in Basra. I took my car and I went to Baghdad and I went to the palace and uh, I was sitting in like a reception and a tented window come to me of Mercedes. They put me in the car, they drive me inside and we stopped outside the palace, shaped the door like an eagle. And uh, I went inside. It was a uh, office, and I was waiting. And other came inside. How are you, my friend? How are you keeping? I hear you doing well, and this and that. And I, I was shaking, and I look at him. I say, "Hi, how are you?" And, and he say, "To make it shorter for you, what do you think to be Saddam's son?" In Iraq at the time, we all call we are all Saddam's sons. And uh, I say to him, "We are all Saddam's sons." He say to me, "No, I given you." a job to be my FIDA. FIDA in Arabic language means body double or bullet catcher. And I played stupid. I say, can you explain more for me? They say, you know, the intelligence service report say the, we look like each other and like that, and I want to be Odai Saddam. And I say, can you explain more, this bodyguard or something like that? He say, no, you be my FIDA and this is the job. And I say to him, any choice? And he said to me, yeah, we live in a free country and you can say what you want to say. And if you refuse, you go back to your army. If you say yes, you have all my power. Foolishly, I, I believed him. And then I say, you know, I don't like to do this job. And I want to go back to my army. I finish and I work in business with my father. Before I finish my work, he press a button was in his desk. Two person come inside, take my rank covered my eye and they dropped me in the boot of the car 
and I ended in a cell was one meter by one meter. Everything was painted red. The light is red, the wall is red, no window, no nothing, and I can't move. Seven days later, when he come in and opened the door, he said, you have a cho choice now. You go to get, accept this job, or I bring your sisters here. This means he raped my sisters, and this is typical of it. I say, no, please leave my family alone, and I do what you want. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. I don't think people can imagine that. that, that, that before we start talking about the, the things that you went through and what you experienced, a couple of key questions I have to ask you, because obviously um, we were fed in the West an awful lot of information um, that I suppose it suited our governments to tell us about what was happening in Iraq and, and the regime that Saddam led um, and presided over in that country. For the normal person living in Iraq, what was life really like, you know, going back to 1990, you know, after the Iran, the, the war with Iran, go, before the first Gulf War, and then, and then in between the, that and the second war, what was the day-to-day -day life of an, an Iraqi like? Uh, I'll be very straightforward and honest with you, and mm. I think and I believe so much. Last 20 years, I, I, I tried to tell the truth what was going in Iraq because this is in a history. If you don't tell it in correct way, I don't go to play the game of America. The winner, they won, they write the history. No, I know. That's why I'm asking you that. I think yeah. you could tell by the, the tone of my question what I was get, um, getting at. When, when Saddam came on as a president of Iraq, you see, I'm not a Saddamist. I'm not a supporter of Saddam. I fight this regime long, long time ago. But this man, he did a lot of good things for Iraq and Iraqis, and he did the bad things for Iraq and Iraqis. He built Iraq. He completely renewed Iraq. Hotels, nightclubs, everything you imagine in the West. They was, in the Middle East, they was calling back that Paris of Middle East. And even in the war, for eight years, nobody felt anything in Iraq. When you go in Baghdad, you have nightclubs, you have uh, hotels, clean roads, motorways, a medical, medical system. Was a justice there? Was every single thing you can find in the West, you can find it in Iraq too. Plus that, Saddam Hussein, he was a friend of the West. This is why nobody was talking about the human rights or anything else. By daily life for any Iraqi, he wake in the morning, he have a job, he have a wage, the country was so safe, you know, you can leave your door open. Nobody can steal anything because this is how was Iraqis. Look at now after what's called liberation of Iraq. We don't have medical, we don't have justice, killing one and a half million Iraqi killed past eight years. Not Saddam, he didn't do this in 35 years. When I talk like that, the Western government, they don't like me. This is why I still stateless past 20 years I'm in the West. People think, because I wrote books, a movie coming out, I am multimillionaire of those things. I never get a cent of anything because I didn't write the story to make money. I have the reason to write this book and the movie and everything. Was two message. A message to the Iraqi government, this is what you did to me and my people. And the second message was to the Western government, you supply us with Saddam, you support him, and you was watching he killing Iraqi people. Would you stop supporting all these dictators? The Western government, they didn't like that. Past 20 years, I'm jumping from country to country to country. I can't find a home for myself. And what I find, past 20 years, who is getting citizenship and residency in the West? Murder, con men, fraud people, and the people what they sold themselves to the Western intelligence service. I've been offered citizenship, but if I cooperate with the CIA, for example, or these intelligence services, I, I've been forced once. I can't do it again. And when I refuse, they told me clearly, front of my wife, my wife is Irish, not, I'm not talking about Iraqi woman. 
They told me clearly, you never go to have one day relax here in the West. And this has happened, and they deliver their promise to me. You see, thank you for putting that across. Um, I was aw- I was aware of the problems that you'd had. I just, you know, it's all very well. I can go into the detail and you can agree with it, but to hear it come from you yourself is so much more powerful, Latif. And, you know, you touch on things there that people in the West at times don't want to know, don't want to believe about the propaganda they are fed from the media and from the um, from the governments about what the, the true intentions of what is really going on. And to hear you speak so passionately like that, I hope it opened a few people's minds uh, and eyes as to what is truly no, happening. The Western people, they are victims like me and you. Why are you working seven days a week and you pay your tax and you are worried about your mortgage, your family and like that, and the government take the money and blow it in a stupid war? What happened to, since 2003 when they invade Iraq? Look at the war completely collapsed. I know. And look at Afghanistan. Yeah. I mean, we could sit here talking all day. Look at the banking system. You know, I had a rant Absolutely. before before Such I came... a corrupt system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, look, we, that, that's a separate subject, you know, and that's, but, uh, great to talk about, but I want to focus on you. So let's go back yeah. now, okay, and um, we have the situation where you, you're blackmailed. You, you have no choice but to agree to undergo um, being Udi. And... You sat through. You have to sit through somewhere in the region of uh, thirty, no, well, well, hours, thirty films, hours of tapes of you day, and that they really remodel you to the point where at the end they give you plastic surgery so that you are unmistakable. Un- you know, you can't distinguish between you and you do. You are a true double of him. Yes. After uh, I, d- I don't say agree. I've been forced to take yeah. this job. They bring me to the palace, one of Oday Palace. That's fantastic, beautiful, it's like a thousand nights and nights. You have everything, you have people around you, you have a swimming pool, you have your, you know, everything. What in your in head, in your dream to have, you have it. A couple of weeks later, two doctors coming from, I think they are Eastern European, because after I come out, I start to understand the language. They start, uh, you know, see what the difference between me and Ode was. Uh, my front teeth was a chain, and other he is taller of me three centimeters. They did a plastic surgery for my teeth and my chain, and I started using high heel shoes. And uh, after that, the training started. When the training started, they were showing me videos how other he walking, talking, move his hand, and all these things. And I was repeating like an actor. Mm-hmm. And this is was okay, it's not easy because I'm not an actor, but I have a good trainer and they was teaching me exactly what I do. And the worst thing what happened after that, they, when they start showing me all the torture, the videos of people, you know, how they tortured them, how they hit them, how they cut their fingers, ears, you, you just imagine all these things, even you watch it in a movie, you don't believe it. I was very sick for a couple of weeks because, okay, I was in war. I said I see dead bodies because of the war. We were soldiers to soldiers. Yeah, but torture is a different thing, Latif. Torture is different. I can't believe a human being can do this to another human. Latif, what what, what was the purpose of them showing you these movies? Why? After I walked, this is why... I was saying to them what, what the reason. The answer was, this is was in the Soviet Union and Eastern European uh, to show you all this to kill all the humanity inside you. When you be in the power, you don't feel sorry for anybody or anything happen in front of you. So it's to numb you completely. Yeah, to so completely uh, you heartless. You don't see anything. You feel sorry for it. And you just keep going. This is why Saddam regime was so strong. And all these dictators in Arab countries, they're all strong because they don't have heart. Okay, so this this is true. I mean, it's not just the case. They want you a complete double, not just a body double, but an emotional double of him as well. Yes, everything to be a copy of him. And the world is coming more. When we finish watching all these videos for a couple of weeks, they start bringing me to the prison. 
to see the torture of life. And here I was very sick and very ill. And up till now, 20 years I am out, I have a panic attack. You see me, I'm talking to you and I'm heavy breathing. Yeah. And uh, I went to counseling, I went to psychology for five years. And I still, I 20 years out, I don't sleep in the night. I'd be lucky if I go to the bed four o'clock in the morning. And I keep carrying with me all the, these things, you know. I get shot 11 times. I carry 26 scars on my body. And... Uh, well, just to... Und- sorry, let me interrupt. Just to, to un- underline to my listeners here, you have survived 11 assassination attempts, um, wounded nine times by bullets, all... All of those in t- attempts uh, on your life were actually intended on Uday, but you were the man in the f- that they saw as Uday at that time. Now, that must be horrendous, but there's a question I have for you, Latif, yeah. and that is, psycholog- apart from all that going on, losing your own identity or trying to have your own identity knocked out of you in that way, what... Did, did that? I mean, that must be have an incredible psychological damaging effect on you, to be, to lose, you know, to start losing who you are yourself. I lost myself the day I I met Ode, and it's still something kept in my head. Say, I am Latif Yahi. I'm not Ode. I'm not with this gangster. I kept all the words what I learned from my father. I always was looking my family, my sisters, my brothers, how I raised. But I tried to save my family. I did that. I paid heavy price for everything. When I come out and I wrote the book, oh, day he killed my father. He prisoned my mother and sister and my brother in, in a prison, an intelligence service, and I know what this means. Mm-hmm. I get four assassination attempts here in the West, twice in Vienna, one in London, and one in Norway. And I still, you see, Still, I'm fighting for justice. I was very angry when I saw they killed. I smashed the TV, and I was very angry because I was hope one day I see him in, in a court like his dad, and I stand in front of the judge, and I say, this man, he did this to me. I want to take my shirt, and I say to the judge, look at the scars on my body. Look at this man, what he did to me. He killed my father. He humiliated me so much. He tortured me. And now even I left to the West, his shadow behind me, because the Western government, they don't charge me as a human being. He's been suffered all that. Just they look at me always. My title, the double of Oday Saddam. My title, anywhere I go, they don't say lucky. The young man, what he did, went through that. I didn't go and apply the torch job. I didn't go and I said to oh, they come on, take me, I want to work for you. I come to the West with food of hope. I say one day I find the justice. Because we are so stupid in Middle East, we believe the West, they don't lie. They, you can't do anything. You have a free speech. You know, every time I do college, university speech, and like this, I be invested for a couple hours. Where is the free speech? I've been... You know, you humiliated see, in Iraq, and I've been humiliated here in the West. Okay, well, Where I'm, going, I go? I'm going to go through some of the things that you've been through, just for my listeners. But speaking to Latif Yahia, who was uh, who spent several years uh, through no choice of his own as Yudi Hussein, the son of Saddam Hussein's uh, body double. Now, when you managed to escape from a Iraq in the first place, you went to the uh, you went to the United States. Firstly, no, no, Aus- no. Austria. This- the CIA took me to Austria, yes. Right, the CIA took you to Austria. Um, where, because your family was still in Iraq, you refused to help them, which is quite understandable because you, you feared about their own family's safety, as, as you've just touched on. And you were imprisoned for nine months as a result of that, weren't you? I'd been tortured by CIA for ten and a half months in Vienna. Right, tortured by the CIA. The man who comes yes. out of there to try and get help and he ends up tortured by the CIA. In right. ten and a half months, I want, they took me like I was 105 kilo, full of muscles, with full of energy. I get out of the prison by mistake. 63 kilo, 
I can't speak even. I can't even walk. They broke every bone in my body. This is why, since I come in, I wrote the book, The Devil Double, was a propaganda. I've been used by media. I've been used by the intelligence service. I've been used by Western government. And when I wrote my experience with the CIA, what happened to me after I left in a book called The Black Hole, is banned in America and banned in Ireland and banned in any bookshop because it's not suitable for their agenda. It you wasn't... See the double faces? Yeah. It wasn't just the West that betrayed you, though, because the, even the, your, your fellow Arabs, the Saudi Arabians, turned against you as well, didn't they? When you didn't yes, play with them. Because, yes, because I wrote what happened. I wrote what happened to me from 92 up to 97 when I arrived to Ireland. And absolutely, the book is, is, is humiliated. But they are stupid. The CIA, I always, you know, I, I say they are the stupid intelligence service I met in my life. I met a lot of intelligence service. They are clever. They look, they were talking to me in an intelligent way, not the CIA. And a lot of people, they say, you are paranoid. I'm not paranoid. My wife, if I was a dreamer or I am making a story, my wife would be at home in the CIA coming to me and talking to me. Is this fabrication too? She's an Irish, and she talked to the intelligence service in Ireland too and told them this is what's going on with us, and we can't take it anymore. Did we live in America or we live in Ireland, an European country? Still, I'm 15 years in Ireland. I'm a lawyer, and I'm married to an Irish citizen. I don't have even parking tickets, not even a criminal record. My kids, Irish. By Irish law, if you live in Ireland five years, you get citizenship. By Irish law, if you marry an Irish citizen three years, you get an Irish citizen. I'm living 15 years. Twice I've been refused. My third application now, over five, four years, I'm waiting for an answer. And was very clearly, that I've been told by, by, by high-level government, and he's my friend, he said to me, Latif, we can't give you citizenship because you're breaking our relation with America. Here you go, this is the democracy you're talking here in the West. So it's the pressure coming in from the United States to make sure that you are not getting... And what's your, what is the problem? What's the United States' problem with you? The fact that you wouldn't work with them right back at the very beginning? Yes. America... I'm not talking American people. American people, I have yeah. thousands of friends, American. Americans, they are victims like me too. But American government, American foreign policy, American CIA, they don't like somebody tell them no. They think... They are American, they own the world. Anybody else is an animal, can be slave for them anytime they want. Because they took me out of Iraq, they think they bought me for life. Because they took me out of Iraq, they think I can sell my soul for money. My wife, she is hearing me now. She can tell you exactly how many millions I've been offered to shut my mouth and keep quiet and put my head down and live my life. Are you not tempted? No. Are you not tempted to take the offer? No, because I'm not for sale. Two, and believe me when they offer me this this money, me and my wife, we don't have seven euros to buy a packet of cigarettes. She was working and I was working too. I have two jobs and I say no, because I'm not for sale. If I want to sell myself, I'd be cheap in the eyes of the people. I have a thing in the world. I, I went through hell. I was telling the people, don't let anybody rule your life. I am sick, I'm ill. Two years ago, I've been diagnosed with MS. And you know MS is very horrible things to happen yeah. to anybody. I, I'm happy to move and happy to do anything. And I'm two years in Ireland. I'm waiting just to put me in a hospital to see what I have. Till I completely damaged, you know, Still, up till now, they didn't put me in hospital. Five months ago, my wife and me decided to leave Ireland because there's no life for us anymore. They was killing me slowly. Okay, so... And they told me, they told me, you know, we don't want you here. You, you a, breaking our relation with America. You were a problem. a lot of Irish living in America. You were a problem for them. You were a, a problem which they wanted rid of. So, what's... I mean, I have to wrap up now that... Um, 
Latif, but what is the future for you now? When you tell me what my future, I don't have a future because what's keeping me alive up till now, good friends and beautiful wife and kids, it wasn't those in my life. I hung myself a long time ago because I don't have a home, I don't have a family, I don't have a country. When you are, you know, <laughs> when you don't have that, what do you live for? Okay, I have money. So what? The money never buy happiness. Money is, is a tool to use it for your daily basis, not to make you happy. I want a country. I want to be... Now, for example, I am, I'm in France. And say you are British or American. If something happened to you in Spain, you call your embassy and come to you. If something happened to me now, who I call? I'm not Iraqi. I'm not Irish. I'm not nothing. And this happened to me in Cyprus. When I was in Cyprus, my travel document expired. The Irish government, they said to me, we can't do anything to you. Only we can give you a ticket and you go back to your country. <laughs> it's an in incredible story, Latif. It, it really is. I'm, I'm glad I've been able to give you the opportunity to come on and, and tell people here, uh, not just in Spain, but across, uh, across the world on the internet who listen to us, uh, and this this interview will be repeated again on Sunday um, about your story. I only wish you some form of happiness at some at some stage in your life and some sort of res resolvement to the way things have gone for you. Um, you are, are you still blogging on the internet? Are you still doing your blog? Yes, I still blog and I still send in messages around the world. Okay, and I want to thank you so much for to giving me this opportunity and free speech this is first radio station i did past 20 years give me this opportunity to say what i want to say without of editing well you've gone out live you've got your message across you uh, and this is what this station is all about okay it's about le uh, letting people see the alternative view to what really is happening out there and giving people the kick the opportunity to come on and say uh, and tell their story what is the blogging site if people want to have a look, Latif? You can go to my website, it's latifyahia.com. Sorry, say that again? Latifyahia.com. Latifyahia, so that's L-A-T-I-F for Freddy, Y-A-H-I-A.com. Latif, it's been a pleasure to speak to you, and um, 